take it away, Kathy. Okay. All right. So where we're going to start with our conversation today is thinking about what you want to learn. Then we're going to really frame what the key components of an IELCE program are based on the law. And then we're going to talk about your challenges to implement it. And this is really where I want your comments and feedback, because as Nelson provided me feedback um, on this PowerPoint, it was really about the implementation strategies and how to do it very well. So I know that we're going to be able to give you guidance, support, and information. So I'm going to, again, ask you to really engage in that chat feature so that I can capture this information. And then we'll talk about our next steps. So um, before we do that, I'd like you to kind of go into the chat feature and tell me what brought you today. What do you want to learn? Okay. Um, there's interest in programs looking at applying for an IELCE program. Okay, Teresa, ideas for implementation. Okay, that might be more in our follow-up response. Um, Susan, IELCE requirements um, and English um, language classes. Okay. Oh, looking at kind of shoring up a program to make sure it's being delivered very well. Great. Oh, when a program should be classified as an IELCE or an ICAPS during the approval process. Great question. How others are implementing this, wonderful. Um, Anne, I love your conversation about how it both meets the requirements and helps the students. Um, I will tell you in my conversations with our team reviewing this, that was the forefront of their feedback is where is this meaningful to our learners? So I'm really glad that you centered this conversation on what they need. Okay, so as you're thinking about this, um, continue to add that to the chat. Again, I will be using these comments and notes. So I wanna start with understanding we, the Workforce Investment and Opportunities Act and the IELCE. When WIOA passed, there were significant changes to adult education systems. And that included how we um, serve to advance immigrant integration. Now, we've always talked about immigrant integration. Um, and, and I'm going to, again, rely on some of the conversations I had with Nelson as EL Civics did talk about integrating um, individuals and immigrants into our systems quickly. But IELC ha IELCE has a unique focus on workplace and work-based learning. IELCE is intended to promote both economic, well, economic, linguistic, and civic integration. Um, but we're looking at advanced skills need to function as parents, workers, and citizens. So the key function here is the employment work-based level that is added to an IELCE program. The difference is that it, it, IELCE shares some characteristics with what was formerly known as EL Civics. IELCE stated goal is to really um, get individuals into the workforce. Um, and to help um, individuals build their English language skills. It's a different focus than EL Civics. EL Civics does not exist anymore in the law. It is fully IELCE. And what does this mean? What does this change mean for everybody? EL Civics was converted to IELCE programming. So often I hear um, when we're talking to programs, they refer to this as EL Civics. That is no longer and has not been um, an offering from our federal basic funding for several, several years. Um, EL Civics does not exist anymore. It is solely IELCE. IELCE has a narrow focus on employment and economic outcomes, okay? This is the key is part of what I wanted to do when we talk about getting back to the basics is kind of reset how we think about IELCE. Because again, 
when I talk to programs across the state and they often ask me about their EL Civics program and EL Civics um, was converted to IELCE with the passing of WIOA. So I wanna pause here and I wanna get your responses in the chat. What are you thinking? What is what is what I'm saying familiar to you or is it a different understanding of what you've had about IELCE? Yes, Daisy still uses EL Civics and you're correct, it does add to the confusion. I am working on getting that changed. Um, are there new competencies? So um, we do have competencies and we're working on a process to update them and add new ones, um, but we don't have that fully fleshed out yet. Um, I know that uh, as we evolve and grow, we see more room for suggested changes. So I think that that's something that we're gonna be talking about as we continue to move forward. And again, a lot of what I'm talking today is about the difference between EL Civics and IELCE. And I purposefully and intentionally chose this direction because there seems to be a lot of confusion about what IELCE is. And we tend to rely on our old programming. And to your point, yes, it still li lists um, EL Civics in our data collection system. And I'm working on getting that changed. So IELCE really brings in the workforce system into our programming. Um, there is a required component of access to an IET, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. EL Civics addressed broader needs to social and civic integration. So we could focus on seeking um, parents seeking support to the children's education, or newcomers seeking how to better understand navigating our US system and culture. That was EL Civics. IELCE, again, and I'll say this, has really got a narrow scope and it's about the economic and workplace integration into the English language programming. So what are the required components of an IELCE program? You must address English language instruction. You must incorporate civics instruction. But here's where it's very specific. You must include workforce preparation into your IELCE instruction. So in addition to English language learning and civics engagement, you absolutely must include workforce preparation. And the thing about the IETs is a student must have access to an IET. That is the, they must have access to an operational IET. So to the question that was posed earlier, do you need to separate the type of ICAPS or IELCE when you submit your proposals? You do not need to distinguish which one that you're getting proposals for because an ICAPS is an ICAPS. You know, we're serving those students in a workforce training program. So we simply need the submitted um, approval form for any ICAPS. And then when you get that approval, you run it for your IELCE or your adult ed or your ESL program. We don't need to know specifically in that what this looks like, okay? I'm gonna pause here because these are the required components of IE. IELCE programming as defined by law. So let's talk for a minute and I wanna hear, feel free to unmute yourself, feel free to type in the chat um, and I wanna hear your thoughts and concerns about this. So Kathy, I wanna address something really quickly. Okay. Um, the IET is the federal name for in Illinois, what we call ICAPS. So ICAPs and IETs are exactly the same thing. So if you are just seeing IET for the very first time and you're like, I don't have an IET, I have five ICAPs, you are still okay. You don't have to have, IET is not something separate. Just, just to clarify that. Yeah, I, I think, thank you for that because I do think we have a lot of people say, is it an IET or is it an ICAPs? So we Illinois yes. by the IETs. <laughs> Um, we Illinoisified them, so we came up with the ICAPS, so they are the same thing.
Okay, so I'm gonna read Megan's question. Does access mean that students can eventually move into an ICAPS once their English language skills qualify them? Or does it mean we have to have an, a specific IELCE focused ICAPS opportunity? That's a great question. What we need is for students to have an access to an ICAP that they can be successful in. Now, if they can be successful in an ICAP that your program is offering for adult learners, that's fine. If you look at our provider manual, we have looked at ways to allow you to expend IELCE funding if a student has reached NRS uh, levels six and passed out of English language learning. Um, you can still use your IELCE funding for the ICAPS program, as long as the student is still singing, seeing some English language supports. So we can work with you on those specific details and kind of guide you and navigate through it. But the key here is they have to have access to an ICAPS and that access needs to include the support that the student needs to be successful, whether it's support classes, English language supports, or anything like that. The key here is access and support. I'm gonna pause to see if we have any more questions. And Kathy, to clarify something else, workforce preparation is general workplace type of training. It's not specific. This is what a CNA does. This is specific to what a, a construction worker does. This is specific to a phlebotomy. Workforce preparation can be resume building, mock interviews, talking about timesheets and payroll and pay stubs. All of those types of things are workforce preparation, correct? Like general terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I would agree okay. to that. Um, and the question that follow up to support your conversation said, would digital literacy skills be considered workforce preparation? And I would say yes to that. I would say that they would be considered a workforce preparation because in order for a student to be able to work in, in our um, sectors today, they do need to have some digital literacy skills. So yes, I would say that that is something there. Okay, the next question that I see is, are students still tracked via the civics competency list, the competencies on the ICCB website? Currently, yes, we are currently using those competencies as a way um, to demonstrate the skills that a student is learning because those are civics competencies. And that list also includes some workforce competencies as well. So those can be used and should be used to guide the instruction. So I have an interesting uh, conversation and question. Um, from participants saying, how do we serve a student who doesn't want to go into an IET? The key here is a student has access to the IET. I mean, we cannot and should not force students to do what they don't want to do as far as an IET, okay? What we do have to do is give them access to high quality instruction, high quality IETs. If a student doesn't choose to participate in it, that is a student's choice but the rest of the IELCE instruction is occurring. They're getting the English language instruction, they're getting the civics instruction, you're using competencies, and you're including workforce preparation in the instruction. Okay, you must have, and I'll say that again and again, you must have that workforce preparation in your IELCE program. And as we said, that's not specific. That's very, that can be general. Correct. So again, if they, if they, if you, if a program is only offering um, an IT and a CNA I caps, and this particular student wants to go into automotive or auto body type of things, they still need workforce preparation. They still need to know how to fill out an application and how to do an interview and what does showing up on time mean and what does calling in sick mean and wearing the right clothes on the day, you know, getting the right uniform. They still need those skills, which is where the workforce preparation comes into play, not as much as the specific skill, specific job they're going after. That is correct. Unfortunately, a program that cannot offer, let's say if I want to go into healthcare, 
and they are not offering her care because they're offering manufacturing, then the my contextual instruction is gonna be for the manufacturer and not for the health care that I want, and that I might not choose to go into that because of that. But if it's include everything in general, then that's okay. But if you ask them to pick an industry and that's not what well, it's in demand in that area, so therefore it's not what I'm offering, it might not lead them into that. And at the last moment, yeah, the student made the decision whether they want to go into IET or not. And it's very likely that they might choose the bridge because it's less demanding. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna continue to move on to the next question. I was told that we were required to have a bridge class, not an IET, can I clarify? So yes, um, about two years ago, uh, we were trying to provide support and strategies for all of the IELCE programs, especially during a pandemic, when many programs did not yet have an IEL, an IECAPS program. Um, and to try and support you, um, we allowed programs to have a bridge uh, program at their location as opposed to an ICAPS to get up and running because those bridge programs do qualify in many cases as a workforce preparation because you're learning about an industry, you're learning how to um, look at different industries and there's a lot of work in that space that can be used for your workforce preparation. Um, I'm not saying you have to have an ICAPS, I'm saying you have to have access to an ICAPS. So that is kind of where we are. Um, and if you look at what a good bridge program should do in that cluster, in an industry cluster that will help career exploration, which is a workplace skill. Um, as Angela said, understanding what those job roles are and what you need to do to be able to get into those roles. Those are all broadly um, part of a bridge program. So um, that would be like that first step. Okay, I hope that clarifies that, but if, if it doesn't, let me know. Okay, so there's another comment in here, and I wanna talk about students who receive IELC content tend to be beginning intermediate NRS levels one through four. They have access to an IET. They're not yet qualified for one. And again, one of the reasons I wanted to focus on this is to talk about what an IELCE is, okay? This is a requirement by law for an IELCE. IELCE may not be the right program for an NRS level one or two learner. They might get funded out of your um, federal basic state basic funds, performance funds in those funding streams. And when they um, increase their language skills to an NRS level three, four or above, we can serve them out of IELCE money. Um, again, it's looking at who is eligible under what funding stream. And I do understand that we're serving a lot of um, students who are pre-literate in their native language, let alone trying to learn English language. I understand that we're serving a lot of um, basic um, ESL speakers, but those students technically should be served out of federal basic, state basic, or performance funding. And we should be able to use IELCE funding for students who are at a higher level. Now, I will tell you with that being said, we are never gonna audit um, and look at your students and their entrance level of where they are and how you're serving them because the priority is to serve students. But you have to understand what um, the IELCE funding is really a, um, called out in the law and it's called out for workforce preparation. I do think, and I would open this question up for conversation, that there is a student who is at an NRS level one is probably not yet ready to be um, talking about resumes and employment and things like that. They're trying to learn basic language. But as they progress at new levels, we can start building them into the IELCE program. And I wanna pause and I wanna hear your thoughts. And I do have another question. What happens when the IELCE leads directly to entry level CTE program? I would consider that um, absolutely within the scope of what this law says. I would probably frame, possibly, depending on how your program runs, um, 
possibly do a bridge class to, to kind of teach some of those um, skill sets. And it could be a bridge to careers, you know, it could be a broadly speaking like that, and then funnel those students into CTE. Um, and that would work. Absolutely. The next question, do employer-based ELA classes qualify for IELCE funding? If those employer-based classes include the civics instruction, that workforce preparation, it can be those soft skills so those students can maintain and retain their employment. And um, yes, I would consider that as meeting those expectations because we're assisting those individuals um, possibly increase at their jobs, um, be retained at their jobs, seek promotions or even full-time status. So it does adhere to kind of the, the intent of the law, which is very much based on workforce and work-based preparation. It will benefit them better if they are at those NRS level that they are reportable like high beginning and up. And I'm so appreciative that Nelson is here because he's the one that gave me some really good feedback um, on how to do some of this um, as we were planning it. So those insights about teaching to those competencies, building your programs with the ESL content standards, connecting all of this to what the learner needs at the various NRS levels. Um, we have the expertise to help you um, plan this for the benefit of your learners. So let's move on. Okay, so really that's that's an IELCE. We talked about the four components of an IELCE, the focus and the intent of the law. What I really wanna do and as what we are as an agency always interested in is hearing from you what your challenges are, what you need from us to be able to do this well. So the rest of our conversation is really for us to hear from you. Um, and I'm gonna pause my talking and I'm going to listen. And so I'm gonna ask you to either type in the chat or raise your hand and we'll unmute you so that we can you know, get everyone talking together. I wanna hear about your challenges to implementing an IELCE, get in my notebook so I can write them down. And I wanna hear from you. And if I don't hear from you, I'm gonna start calling you out by name and asking you what you're seeing at your program. So please feel free to start sharing with me, your, sharing with our team, your concerns. And since this is a Zoom meeting, if you would like to unmute yourself, you have that capability. And if you want to raise your hand and be called on, you can do that as well, but you are able to unmute yourself. Okay. I have a question. Are there like levels uh, when they go through this uh, program as far as like English language first and then go into civics, work preparation, then eventually um, the integrated education and training? Um, that's a great question. No, we don't have them in sequence. It is a thought that um, these things are taught consecutively and built into a lesson. I am going to um, ask Nelson to chime in with a tip and then I'm gonna ask Angela to kind of um, from the workplace side of it, answer both of those. So Nelson and then Angela. Well, originally it said that it had to be concurrently. Unfortunately, people misunderstand or have different idea what concurrently is. Mm -hmm. To me, it was that it had to be taught everything at the same time, you know, as you go and you teach your English language and then you add your uh, competencies to that and so on. Mm -hmm. A lot of time people just do it at the end, in the middle, whatever, but there's no way to really track down how to do it as long as it's done. We did ask the Fed before and they said that if it's done, it's done. I don't know what we decide here in Illinois. I think that it should be happening at the same time because that's what concurrently means to me. But I think people understand different. Uh, Angela might have a different point of view and uh, the two professional development uh, person for an ALRC might also see it differently. So. Let's see what you guys have to say. Angela? 
So I have about 20 years of background in ESL and various levels, various skills, locations kind of things. Um, so part in, in my head, part of it, there's part of me that says it needs all kind of mixed together. So they're working on some English skills while they're working on the civics, while they're working on the job, because maybe part of the job preparation is you're talking about interview questions that are appropriate to ask. How do you answer interview questions? So then you're talking about the grammar of forming a question and you're talking about, you know, allowability of questions like that's on the civics competencies list. So in, in my head, a lot of it kind of blends together. But I also know, I also understand what you're saying that sometimes you've got to have some English foundation before you can form that question to ask at the interview. So sometimes it there are some building pieces, but you know, there's there I I don't have a good answer for you either. I'm sorry. <laughs> part of me says blend it and part of me says separate it and build it. And it is difficult because the bottom line is that people don't understand how demanding the curriculum and the civic uh, lesson plan is because it has to include all of this. And that's what makes it difficult. And that's why it's easier to just maybe do it in separate parts than put it all together into the same lesson plan every single day. So you right. have to decide how is it better for you to present it to your students based on the capability of the students that you have, whether you have a multi-level class or you have a separate class for a specific level, and then you can do other things. But you need that, to take that I, would, consideration. I would think that they would need a, a basic English understanding before they could go into uh, civics education or workforce preparation or even like training. And they, that's why we suggest that they start a high beginning or low intermediate, because at that level, they will be able to understand and to achieve the competency. They will have the English language skills that they need for that. In the past, we allow lower level people because they need it and their competencies that were easy enough for them to achieve. But some of our competencies are a little bit more demanding. And the higher you are on an ESL and the better knowledge you have, and you're better understanding of the English language, and the better you're going to be, and you're going to be more successful. You're going to be able to achieve right. everything and do everything that the class requires. OK, thank you. You're welcome. And, and as you have and implement these IELCE programs, as you have questions for support, we are here to support you as you work through some of these complicated um, conversations. I do want to read a couple more questions that are coming in. Um, one of them is many of our adult ed students are not looking for jobs instead of being at a, a stay-at-home mom, parent, a stay-at-home parent, or they're retired. How can we teach them while still meeting IELCE standards? So I, I will tell you that, again, the IELCE has a very specific work-based focus. That is currently what the law says. I will tell you that um, possibly a retired individual who is not going to enter the workforce should be served out of your federal basic, state basic, or performance funding. But those individuals who determine they want to be a stay-at-home parent, you can do career exploration because at some point they may choose to enter the workforce. And building those skills so that they have those to lean on as they um, as their life evolves. You know, the children grow up, they get bigger, the parent may want to enter the workforce um, or something like that. So integrating those work-based skills are, are things that we can do for all of our students, um, whether they choose to go into a specific IET that they have access to um, is, is not necessarily a requirement, but ensuring that work-based learning is taught is the requirement. And for those students who are not necessarily in the workforce right now, they may be in the workforce in the future. So building those skills in those classes could be very helpful. Can I add something um, to that, Kathy? Go ahead. So even though they're stay-at-home parents or they're retired, you may be able to, and Kathy can clarify if this would count or not, um, some of those workforce preparation skills are also similar to what school expectations might be. Are you going to show up for class every day? Are you going to be on time every day? If you need to miss, are you? do you need to call in to someone, send a text, an email, something? You know, some of those workforce prep, how do you interact with a teacher? How do you interact with a boss? How do you interact with coworkers? How do you interact with co-students? 
So while they may not be exact, I mean, they're, they're very, there are some very similar skills and requirements in a classroom to a job. And so while it may not be specifically, this is what you have to do to get a job, it, you're still working on those skills. Kathy, is that, and I haven't yes. read the law, so I don't know all of the details of it. Is that something that would be an allowable workforce preparation type of skill? I, I would absolutely allow that, absolutely. We're looking at ways to adhere to the law to ensure that what we're doing is compliant with the federal expectations of IELCE funding and still allow the flexibility for the diverse learners that we serve. You know, one of the questions that I'm not hearing from this audience that I'm actually shocked hasn't popped up yet is about our undocumented immigrants that we serve throughout our state. And how do we serve those students in IELCE funding when um, legal employment is, is um, complicated, right? So I think um, what we're trying to do is ensure that we have the supports out there for you, that we listen to your needs and that we provide the information so you can run it well. Um, so I'm gonna go to um, a couple of other comments. Let's see, is the, uh, is the distinction of bridge and IELCE the difference in funding source definitions? where bridge students begin the combination of learning English, EL civics and workforce skills and IELCE program offers more specific career instruction and workforce skills. So I wanna take a step back and acknowledge that we are a field of um, acronyms. We talk about ICAPS and bridges and we talk about IELCE and all these different things. So the IELCE is the core component of what we're talking about today. Within an IELCE program, you can provide a bridge program, bridge courses to help students build those workforce prep skills. You can also then transition those students into an ICAPS, but it's not a, it's not a distinction between bridge and IELCE. It's a combination of IELCE includes the bridge. Think of IELC as the big umbrella and it covers all of those pieces. Okay, there, um, let's see. And then there was a comment in the chat. And again, I'm reading these out loud for people who may be reviewing this webinar at a later date and won't be able to see the chat. Um, there are some main ESL textbooks, um, Ventures, Stand Out, Step Forward, Futures, and of course, Burlington English. And they all include lesson content that touches on civics and workforce prep. Okay, so I wanna um, recognize that we do have a, a wealth of, of resources that are aligned with both content standards and the um, components of the IELCE. So there's another question, although this is workforce focused, the standards goals are still listed as housing, democratic process, consumer economics. Should we not track those non-employee degree goals anymore? Track all of them, okay? I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we are working to help immigrants um, be successful in this country. Understanding consumer economics can protect them from um, people being taken advantage of understanding housing rights and responsibilities are critical so that they know they have protections. So I will never say don't include those. What I will say is that we have to have work-based training as a part of what we're doing. And if we do contextualized instruction, we're going to meet all of those needs. Employability skill is part of what we're doing now and there are 50 competencies on employment. There's quite a few on right and responsibility of citizenship, which is what they want on civic engagement. You can look at those competencies and pick the ones that are more suitable for what IELC said, but that doesn't mean that you can neglect the other one because if you see some of the other one that you think that is something that is gonna benefit that student, then you can just go on and present it in the class and achieve it and document it and that's it. But we have plenty of competency and more than 35 to 40 address right and responsibility of citizenship, which is 
the main goal of what we have. And then later on, they added civic engagement and they all involve civic engagement. So even though we're trying to make the list more aligned to uh, what ILC asked, they are still in there. You just have to dig into it and find it because they are in there. Correct, correct. Okay, so I, I hear a lot of questions from me and, I, and I'm really glad that we can answer those and that we have our team here who can bring their expertise forward. But I would like to hear your challenges. I hear your questions about what we can do, but what are your challenges to actually um, operating an IELCE class? That will help me and help our team just determine what supports we can help you with. Yes, you can serve undocumented individuals, absolutely. If there's ever a population in our state who risk um, vulnerability and marginalization, it would be our undocumented individuals at the top of that list. So absolutely, we serve those individuals. Yeah. Now, one of the ways that we could serve them through an IET would be the entrepreneurship IET. And I think that that can be something that our students um, would like, especially the undocumented individuals. It, it provides the heart of what the law says, we're teaching workplace literacy. But for many of these individuals, they might have a daycare on, at their home. They might um, have, you know, do some house cleaning, yard work, landscaping, and uh, you know, food services and all the different spaces that they could possibly be in. They, they, they may turn those into um, some, some time of home business, right? I've seen a lot of the undocumented population in our area, they have food trucks, they have, un, you know, they have businesses. So if we wanna include that through the entrepreneurship program um, and that training, that would fit that, that population. And it would provide them the guidance in how to be protected and how to run a business and things like that. So um, absolutely, that, that, you're serving individuals. The whole EL Civic was more inclusive of undocumented students because we realized that they needed everything that it was in our competency. However, Correct. ILC is more for the legal immigrant. That doesn't mean that the undocumented cannot participate. They can participate, like Kathy, like, uh, Kathy said, mm -hmm. in all of those ones. They can do the first, second, and the third part, where they might have some issue in most cases, not in all of them, in most cases is when they get to the workforce preparation because some industry might not allow them if they don't have that social security. But all the other offerings, they can take it. They can take the English language, the civic preparation, the employability skill, the workforce preparation, as well as the contextualized instruction. And some of those undocumented students may become documented students and then Eventually. obtain a job. So they're gonna need those skills sooner than later. Uh, not big the chances, but. <laughs> not, I mean, not, not a ton of them, but I mean, it's, it, it is a possible route. Yeah. Um, and yes, I, I wanna call uh, two things I wanna call out that are really important in the chat. Um, Joliet Junior College, um, Michelle, I believe that's where you're at, right? I, I believe it's JJC, that they have many undocumented students in the Early Childhood Education Bridge and ICAP so that they can run their own daycare centers. So I do think um, there's room for a lot of, a lot of innovation um, to serve our students. And I do think I wanna call out a comment that was made earlier that, um, from one of our, our participants who said, we have used um, ILC more for social integration in the past as opposed to employability. So this is really just a shift in, in how we support our students. We will do bridge and employability at the higher levels, but use state basic for that um, social integration at that basic level. And that's kind of a way to braid those different funding streams so that you can best serve your students. Whoops, I don't know how I did that. Okay, um, I do wanna talk before I get to the next, the last screen about our next steps as an agency. We are hiring a director for IELCE. Um, and once that position is um, hired and on, on staff, um, the first thing we're gonna try to plan 
is an IELCE in service, something like that. So um, we're, we're thinking of a hybrid, in-person hybrid option um, to bring programs together to kind of talk about what we're doing at that level. So I'm going to kind of ask you, that's our next step is to bring somebody in who can really provide some more direct guidance on some of these complicated questions um, and then start um, kind of shifting into, shifting away from that EL civics language that we use and really focus on IELCE. Um, so my question to you is one, would you be interested in like a full day, three quarters of a day in service on IELCE? Question one. And then question two, if you are interested in that, what do you want it to cover? What do you need it to be? So that's kind of our next step is to support you. So I need to know what supports you want. And let me also add in this, um, I have been in communication with the state of Utah who has been working IELCE and with their ESL classes and with their IET programs for the last couple of years. And so it may be one of those things that when Kathy does this, we may be able, you know, not the entire day, but maybe for a, a small presentation, they're able to talk about, you know, an instructor boots on the ground. How does that work within a class? Minimal, you know, because we're not going to bring them in from Utah. Let's be honest. Nobody has the money for that travel at this point because those airline tickets would be huge, expensive. But I mean, now that, you know, we all know how to use Zoom. It may be an option that we could include one of their instructors or an administrator, somebody in that. And so we've, I, I've been talking with them about that to see how we can, how, how Illinois can, and can as a whole state step up their game and make sure that everything's being done appropriately as it's supposed to be. Um, so I, I, I have a couple of things I'm gonna read from the chat. Um, it sounds like that people are interested in an in-service um, opportunity and ideas of creative ways to integrate um, IELCE, the instruction, um, creative programming spotlighted, um, show how the classes can fulfill the requirements, um, the needs of the IELCE instructor, um, what are the needs for the instructors and how do we support the admin staff who support IELCE program, I love that. Um, and I, there was a comment in here about documenting compliance with um, IELCE and DAISY. So we are planning and there will be um, save the date uh, flyer sent out next week. Um, we're planning a, a hybrid Institute day um, at, in Bloomington. Um, I can't recall, it's in December, early in December. Um, to talk about DAISY and NRS. It will be more of an NRS, like what is the data? Why do we need it? How does it get used? How does it report out? Um, and things like that. We're also gonna put together like single one pagers that support you and how to make sure your students are, are identified correctly. Because remember the new measurable skill gains that we have released. If a student completes an ICAPS, program that is a measurable skill gain. So we're gonna kind of talk about all of that at that DAISY retreat. My question that follows, do you want the IELCE Institute to cover data information or do you want that to be focused on the instruction and support and the IELCE information is covered in the data institute? Okay, so the institute would be instruction focused, support focused, what we need for admins, okay? Um, that's wonderful. And then I will be ensure to include in the NRS day that we're going to do, I will be ensure to include tracking IELCE competencies and what that looks like. Okay. 
So, so we will, and I do agree um, with a comment in the chat that said, we really need to understand the data to understand the instructional outcomes. Yes, that's kind of why we're doing the um, day long um, Institute for Data and understanding that. That's also why we're gonna try to come together with an IELCE Institute um, and, and put those pieces together. Um, it will be in Bloomington. When we do the institute, it's easy for people, uh, well, I'm gonna use the hyphen air quote easy um, for individuals to get to Bloomington because a train will bring you to Bloomington from the Northern part of the state. And it's more central if you're in the Southern part of the state um, with most of our IELCE programming being in Southern and North with only I think two being in the Southern part of the state, I think. Hey guys, I wanna thank you for coming today. That's kind of the presentation and the conversation that we had prepared. Um, I will stick around because I believe we go until 1.30. So we've got a few more minutes. So I'm gonna be around to answer any questions, but if you've gotten your um, information from today and are ready to sign off and take a break before the next presentation, feel free to do so. Um, but for those of you who have additional questions, I'm gonna hang around for another seven minutes. Just a couple housekeeping items as we do wrap up. If you do need a professional development certificate or a certificate of attendance, you'll need to email um, Linda Zimmerman and I'll post her email in the chat there. And if you do need a PD certificate, your name will need to be appearing. So I know I said that at the beginning, but just a reminder, please make sure your name is not like Rockstar 25 because we don't know who Rockstar 25 is. It's Amy, of course. There you go. Yes, because I'm almost 25. <laughs> I love that answer. Angela and Kathy, this is Teresa, and I'm going to jump in. Um, coming from an instructional perspective, um, I I was I wrote about having inspirational stories. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm finding that the materials are a little dry semester after semester. The reading doesn't really inspire us or turn us on. And so I know that this isn't really your baby, but in talking to our providers, I think we need more examples of entrepreneurs. entrepreneurs. We need videos with real people talking in ESL language, probably with good closed captions so that we can use that as a support if we need it. Um, I'm, I feel quite a bit more limited these days by all of the standards and competencies I need to meet. And so I'm not able to be as creative as a teacher in bringing in lots of things that don't really connect with this whole workforce focus, digital literacy skills, civics, education, et cetera. So, so I'm feeling constrained by all of the requirements that sometimes make creativity difficult, but also sometimes I think my students just aren't inspired and inspiring them come, sometimes helps with persistence, mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. in continuing to work toward their own goals. I, so that's, that's just my, yeah. No, I, I hear what you're saying. I ideally would love to build out that resource that you're talking about with videos in the, in the student's first language, because we would have, you know, um, Russian and we would have um, Spanish. And we would, I mean, I'm trying to think of all the languages that we serve across the state um, and putting things out. So that would be a goal for us to get to, but it's not something that we can realistically pull together in a short term because that is a large project, but it is a well worth it for us to start showcasing um, videos and um, success stories for our students. So we can start working on collecting those. And kind I of think housing those. they can be in English, but, but I want someone speaking in an English that my students can understand. So I don't want a native speaker, blah, 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 full of idioms. I want, right. I want that to be created specifically for an ESL audience 
-hmm. so that the language is somewhat controlled, but it could be in only English. Um, okay. Yeah, so thank you for considering that. Um, I, I think we, we do, the Professional Development Network does an exceptional job of looking at what programs are doing and highlighting and showcasing their successes so that we can see not only pie in the sky, this is what ICCB thinks, but really what programs are doing. Because you need to talk to the programs and hear their stories, right? You don't need me to tell you what I think is a good idea. You need to hear it from people that are actually doing the work. Yeah. So our PDN does a great job of highlighting those stories. So I, we have a, a process to do that. So it can be something we can start building into um, our IELCE um, supports. So, but, but I will tell you that to design that and to um, release that will take time to do it well. Um, so bear with us as we, as we start looking at ways to do that because I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, and I do hear what you're telling me about being overwhelmed with all of these requirements. You know, you have to have a standards-based instruction. You have to have competencies. You have to have digital literacy. I mean, there's a lot in it and I can understand um, your struggle. So one of the things as we build this institute, maybe we can do some teaching models of, of how to do this, where to find those resources and things along those lines. So um, that can be part of what we think about so that we can provide those tools and resources to you. Yeah, certainly if the resources exist, it would be great to have knowledge of them because sometimes we're recreating the wheel. Mm -hmm. And so right. if resources exist, um, we could certainly help each other out by sharing what does work well. Right, like we could share out um, um, JJC's um, early childhood program. We can share out, I believe it's College of DuPage is one, and I can't recall the others that are doing some great um, innovation with entrepreneurship. And I know there's more than um, College of DuPage doing that work, but that's the one that's coming to my brain off the top of my head right now. And we can share those models. We can also share with you models of programs who have done really well-developed bridge programming to help with those students who are coming in at that three and four um, NRS level for English language to prepare them. And that's how they build in that workforce prep. So there are things that we can definitely already, we already know is happening and we can share those models out. Thank and you, I need Kathy. to be the devil's advocate here. So what that means is when we put the request out for those, we need programs that will actually send us that information. Because again, like Kathy said, we think we know what programs are doing, but unless a program says, here's my student, here's a success story, here's my bridge program, this is how it works, we only think we know what's happening. So my, my devil's advocate side is, I agree, these are all great ideas. My devil's advocate side is, make sure you send us one when we request them. That's it. Yeah, I, I would agree to that. Well, I would agree to that. One of our biggest challenges right now is, and I recognize that everyone is so busy and you get so many requests from us about, hey, can you do this? Or, hey, can you share this information? Or, hey, I want this write up. That it can, it can feel like a lot, but the best way for us to amplify your successes and provide that information to everybody else is if you tell us exactly what you're doing. You know, I, I had, and I'm gonna call out on um, Mundelein High School and they ran an incredibly successful um, work-based literacy program. And the only reason we know about that is because um, they emailed us and said, hey, did you know we're doing this? And I said, no, nope, we didn't because you never told us. You know, you're not telling us these wonderful success stories. And then we were able to amplify their success in our uh, monthly ICCB newsletter that goes out to all of our stakeholders, all the legislative offices, it goes out all across the state. And we were able to amplify that success. Um, but you're right, when I don't get those stories, um, and, and I will also tell you things are not marked well in DAISY, then um, we really have struggled putting the narrative behind our data. In the last year's data, out of 28 IELCE funded programs, we had nine students marked as um, IET, ICAPS learners. So out of 28 programs, only nine were marked as um, an ICAP student. So when I go to tell our federal funders our story through our narratives, 
when I tell our state legislators our story through our narratives. I'm limited in what I can share with them because we're not hearing that from you. So reinforce what Angela is saying. The more I hear your stories, the more advocacy work we can do, the more um, you know, extending your stories out, amplifying those successes and hearing your challenges. If anything, and I will close with this statement, you guys are not doing this work alone. You know, I lean on our program support more than I think anybody realizes because they bring levels of expertise in areas that I don't have them. Um, so together um, we can kind of support you in what you're doing. I lean on our work-based um, division because they know all the ICAPs and IETs and all the things that are happening in that space. But I can't bring questions forward if I'm not being asked those questions. So I'm going to leave this today closing up with you are not alone in this work that you're doing. And I don't want you to feel alone in the work that you're doing. I have an amazing um, program support team that are here to help you serve our students. I have amazing leadership at my agency where I can go to and say, okay, this is what I'm hearing from the field. This is what we need to do. And in the last few years, they've been incredibly responsive to all the things I've been able to bring forward that you bring to me. But if you don't bring them forward, I can't amplify those concerns. I will tell you that IELCE is grounded in law. So the, the characteristics we talked about are things that I can't shift away from, but we can find innovative ways to help you do this work. And with that, I will close. Um, you do have our email contact information. Um, I should have put our program support contact as well but um, please reach out to them, reach out to me, reach out to Angela, we're here to help you.